Every year at this time, we jump into the middle of a story that's been told for hundreds of years. It's a story of cities decorating their streets and their sidewalks. It's a story of trees and ornaments and fireplaces, of gifts and wrapping paper and ribbons. There's expectation and wonder and hope, a deep hope that drives us back to the beginning of the story. Because it all starts here. It starts in a manger with a baby and an angel and a scared teenaged girl in love with a misunderstood young man who thinks she's worth it. It's about a child who will bring light into darkness, joy into despair, revealing a God who will redeem it all. A God who is leaving the glory of heaven to pursue the glory of a cross. A God who is becoming flesh and blood and skin a God who is loving and offering all people a pathway back into the relationship for which they were created. It's too rich to comprehend and too beautiful to dismiss. This is Christmas. This is the story of stories. And it all starts here. Hey, welcome back to Branch Life Church. My name is Josh. We are in our final week of our Good News Great Joy series on this very first Sunday of 2021. You have made it to 2021. That is good news and that is great joy. I don't know what God has in store for 2021. I do know that God is up to something and he's on the move and he's up to something good for you, for, for me, for our church, for our community. And so let's lean into God in 2021. And it starts with this conversation. And by the end of our talk today, we're going to be filling you in on how you can have a better 2021. What steps you can take and what we can do together to, to, take, to be healthier and to heal uh, from 2020. So I think you, you should sit and listen and lean in as we go through this conversation together. We are also going to take communion together. And for those of you that have put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we invite you to participate in this communion time with us virtually. So you may have to go and get uh, something to drink and something to eat. The something doesn't really matter. Uh, it represents uh, the body and and blood of Jesus. So go get that while we're talking, have that ready. And about two thirds of our way through, we're going to stop. We're going to take communion, sing a couple of songs together, and then we will wrap everything up. As we end our Good News Great Joy series, if you've missed any of it, we encourage you to jump back to the website and, and catch up. But simply, we have been going through the, the Christmas story through the eyes of the characters that you and I have in our manger scenes at our home. We've seen Jesus through the eyes of the wise, through the songs of the angels, through the heart of a mother. And today we're going to look at it through the steps of a shepherd. This Christmas story, when you are introduced to Jesus in these ways, every character got the good news somehow, some way. And they responded to the good news and it changed their life. Where were you the last time you got some good news, right? Uh, maybe you're a parent and you had that moment where you found out that there was going to be a baby on the way. You were waiting for that, that pregnancy test for, to be a plus or a minus and, and you saw it and as a, as a now expecting mother, you had some good news and it was life changing news and it, it caused you to, to be different and, and you went and ran and shared that with your husband. Maybe you created a, a video, maybe you did some sort of special announcement and and you let him know that, man, we're pregnant. That's some life-changing good news. This good news, a part of this Christmas story, is not only life-changing for those that heard it then, it's life-changing for you and I now, and it's life-changing for our entire world. And wherever you are on your spiritual journey, 
Today, you might be meeting Jesus for the first time, or maybe you are being reintroduced to Jesus or reminded about the life change that is available to you right now. I want you to lean in because we're going to see Jesus through the steps of a shepherd. We're going to ask ourselves a series of questions today. This comes right out of our Bible verses that we'll be looking at. And here are some questions. Let me ask them to you and then we'll move along with our talk. The first question we're going to look at is where were you when you heard the good news? Where were you when you first heard the good news about Jesus? Maybe you were a young person, a little boy or a little girl. Maybe you were middle-aged and you had heard about it somewhere or some way. Maybe as an adult this came to you for the first time. Or maybe you heard it many times but you realized for the very first time that this mattered to you today. Where were you when that happened? And maybe maybe you've not heard about Jesus or it, today's going to be the day. Maybe this is the moment where you'll be hearing the good news. Uh, why did you believe it? Here's a deeper question. Why do you believe anything? We're going to see why we should believe this good news and that it is true. We're also going to ask ourselves, what did you do about it? So when you got good news, right? When she said, honey, we're pregnant, what would you do about it? There's probably cheering, celebrating, maybe crying. Uh, there's, some, there's some news that you shared with other people. You made phone calls. You got on FaceTime. You posted something on the internet. It probably caused you to do something spectacular. And we're going to see what, what this good news did and what it does for us today. And lastly, we're going to ask the question, what difference does it make today? How does this impact us? I know this is a story from thousands of years ago. What does, difference does it make in 2020 where we're running out of toilet paper and dealing with a pandemic? This is going to be some powerful, powerful stuff that this transformation is available to all of us today. And it makes this year that we've gone through and the year that we have coming up uh, exciting and possible. And there's some incredible news connected to this next year, uh, connected to a relationship with God. I want to tell you about Daniel. He, uh, Dylan. Dylan met Christ for the first time. When he first met Christ, he was in a parking lot. And he made a phone call to a friend because his life was just unraveling before him. And he called his friend. He needed encouragement. He needed support. And his friend introduced him to Jesus. And in that parking lot, he, for the first time, believed it. And he made a decision. What he did was he accepted Jesus as his personal savior. He decided to follow Jesus with the rest of his life. And it caused his life to change. He thought, maybe I'll accept Jesus and everything will be better tomorrow. That's not the case. Dylan's story is that he ended up accepting Christ and because of past choices, he ended up going to jail. He had lost his family, he had lost his job, and he lost his freedom. But as he was incarcerated, now a follower of Jesus, believing that God is real, believing that Jesus is the Son of God, and he's offered him salvation and new life, he dedicated his life to Christ. And even while incarcerated, he grew in his faith. His spirit changed, his, his thinking changed, his emotions changed, and he came out of that prison a brand new man. And God multiplied favor on Dylan, and he was able to rebuild, he was able to restore, and he was able to have life more abundantly because of his relationship with Jesus. Maybe your life doesn't feel like it's uh, unraveling, maybe this is something you've heard for a long time, but it's never really connected with you. I want you to meet Kristen. Kristen's going to tell you her story of where she was when she heard the good news, why she believed it, what she did about it, and what difference it makes today. This is Kristen's baptism video. For those of us that have followed Jesus, baptism is our next step in faith, and it's a time of celebrating God's transformation in our lives. So lean in and see if your story at all lines up with Kristen's story. Let's listen to it now as we come together in this moment. I was raised in a Christian home my whole life. My dad was the choir director and organist at my church. I was an avid churchgoer, was involved in Sunday school, the children's choir. And I would say that my reason for going to church was really to please my parents and to gain value from them. And I thought that I was gaining value from God and earning his approval by being a good moral person and going to church. It's just the right thing to do. But it really wasn't until I got to college that I realized that my faith couldn't just, I couldn't just ride the faith of my parents. It had to be my own. And to realize my need for God in my life, to have a personal relationship with Him. It could take many times to actually hear it 
in your heart. Maybe you hear it in your head, but to really hear it in your heart. And so I went to Crew, which is Campus Crusade for Christ, um, a fall retreat for us college students. And there was a moment where the leader had asked us and said, do you know Jesus personally? Do you understand that he came and died for you personally? And that had hit me like it had never hit me before that this wasn't just a faith that, you know, God is high in the sky, but know that Jesus came to have personal relationship with me, me personally for all the wrongs I've done in my life. And the fact that I didn't have to earn his approval that he had called me enough. And so there was a time when they invited us to go out on the lake and have a personal moment with, with God and invite him into your heart and say, Jesus, I, I choose you. I want to walk with you every day. And I've come to the end of myself. I can't do this life alone without you. And that's the moment when I prayed and received Jesus into my heart. The perspective of my life has changed for forever. I was living for people's approval. I was striving. I was felt like I was running this race that was never ending there's never finish line and so now life with christ is just so much more satisfying and i can find rest in him this world can fill your mind with so many lies from the enemy that you're not good enough that you'll never measure up and these are lies that i've struggled with my whole life but i now know the truth that god says i am worthy that i'm loved and i'm chosen and I have a thirst to know what he says about me, that he is who he says he is, and I am who he says I am. So by reading his word and filling up the truth, that is what gets me through my day. Kristen got baptized at her church in December. And we just want to welcome Kristen to the family of God. We're so excited that she's now a sister in the family and, and that we can celebrate even as uh, different churches in different places, people coming to a knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe today, Jesus is calling you into that personal relationship. We want to invite you to do that. So stay tuned. If you have any questions about that, you can go to branchlife.church to the gospel tab and see more about how to become a follower of Jesus. And we're going to talk more about that in just a moment or two. We're going to jump into our Bible study now. And in our Bible study, we're going to talk about these shepherds. This might be the week where you started wrapping up your manger scene, or you're about to wrap it up and put it away. As you grab those shepherds, I want you to realize that they are the last ones to enter the scene here immediately following Christ's birth. They are chosen by God to be a part of this story for a special and powerful reason. So if you have your Bibles, let's turn together to Luke chapter 2, and we'll start reading in verse 15. This is after the angels had presented themselves to the shepherds. They had given them the good news, and we looked at the angel story last week. Here's what it says, starting in verse 15. And when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has just made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they had made known the saying that had been told to them concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all of these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard, for all they had seen, and all that had been told to them. Today, we want to see Jesus through the steps of the shepherds. We want to see what happened to them as they heard this good news and how it caused them to go into action and to move uh, in incredible ways that changed their lives and the lives of people around them. So let's ask our first question today. Where were you when you heard the good news? Where were you at that moment when you first heard about Jesus? I don't know your story, but I want to encourage you wherever you are. Maybe you're sitting with your family. Maybe you're at one of our worship sites. Maybe you are uh, uh, watching this alone. I want to encourage you to share the news about when or the story about when you first 
met Jesus. And again, this could be something that you're hearing anew. Maybe today is the first time you're really learning about Jesus. Maybe you've heard about Jesus your entire life. When was that first moment where it became real to you? I know for me, I was sitting in a classroom and I was surrounded by a bunch of other people and the teacher of the classroom, whose, whose name was Mrs. Good, told us about Jesus. I had heard the name Jesus. I had heard the story of Jesus. It had been something that had been a regular part of conversation for me growing up. But all of a sudden, I realized that this was something that my heart and head needed to know and understand. And if God is real, and if Jesus is God's son, if he is who he says he is, if he is who the story claims that he is, if that's true, then this matters for me. And if I believe that, that's going to change everything. I remember this kind of washing over me in that moment, and, and it became a realization that that I, I couldn't shake, I, I couldn't run from, I couldn't dismiss, I, I couldn't get distracted from, I... I had to do something about it. That's when I first really, truly met Jesus. Where were you when you first truly met Jesus? My challenge is for you to tell somebody about it. Tell that story, post that story, or share it with somebody even now as you're together. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 8, it says, And in the same region there were shepherds out in a field keeping watch over their flock by night. The shepherds were in a field when they first met Jesus. They were out just doing their thing. They were doing their job. They were on the clock. And in this field is where Jesus decided to introduce himself to them. It was an interruption. It, was, it wasn't expected. But all of a sudden, they were having this moment where they were meeting Jesus for the first time. It was these shepherds out in the field that God chose to send an angel to to declare that Jesus had been born and that they're ready to meet him. To declare that Jesus was now here on earth as God's son. God visible, the invisible God is now made visible to us. And these shepherds were out there minding their own sheep, doing their own thing, and they met Jesus. For, for Kristen, that was kind of the thing that happened to her at camp. She was at this camp, she was on this retreat, and all of a sudden she was interrupted by Jesus. He had just presented himself and introduced him to him. For our friend Dylan, who was in a parking lot, just struggling with life and calling a friend, all of a sudden now he's in that moment being introduced to Jesus. And here's what I want you to understand today, that meeting Jesus is always a divine appointment. It's always a divine appointment. For you, it might feel like an interruption. It might feel like it's out of the blue. It might feel like it wasn't scheduled. It was just all of a sudden happening. Imagine if you like turned the corner uh, at the shopping mall. I know we don't go to shopping malls right now because there's a pandemic, but let's pretend we're at the shopping mall. I know we don't go to shopping malls because we have Amazon. Let's, let's just for a moment pretend that we're actually at a shopping mall and you turn the corner and you literally ran into the king of Morocco. And there he is, the king. Of, do you know the king of Morocco? I don't. I just, I'm assuming Moroccans have a king. And here, all of a sudden, you run into this king and you're like, bam, I am in the presence of royalty. How did this happen? Whenever you run into God, whenever you run into Jesus, whenever you are introduced to Jesus, that is a divine appointment. And for you, it might feel sudden, but God always knew it was going to happen. God set up that moment. God scheduled that moment. He planned that moment because it was a divine appointment. He is reaching out and extending his hand to yours saying, Hi, I'm Jesus. I love you and I'm here to save you. I can give you hope for your future. I can give you a home for your eternity. I want to introduce myself. For those of you that believe in Jesus and you're following Jesus, think about that moment that God scheduled it just for you. For those of you that are somewhere on your spiritual journey and you're considering a relationship with Jesus, God has been scheduling his moments to introduce himself to you this entire time. God is available and present in every one of our days and every moment of those days. Do we see him? Do we realize that it's him talking to us? Think about this incredibly powerful truth that God is scheduling his appointment with you even now. The shepherds then lead us to our second questions. Why do you believe it? When you heard about Jesus or when you first heard about Jesus, what caused you to believe this? What caused you to say, hey, I believe it. Why do you believe anything? 
You know, believing things is, is simply realizing that we think what we are seeing or what we are being told is true. So truth and belief go hand in hand. We want to put our faith, we want to put our trust, we want to put our belief in true things. Wherever you are right now, you're sitting in something. You're probably sitting in a chair, in a sofa. Uh, you could be in a car listening to the podcast. You sat down in that chair and you believed it would hold you up. You based that belief on past history, on using that chair before, on the structure of the chair in front of you. You thought, you know what? This is going to hold me. I'm going to trust in this chair. Trusting in Jesus, believing this is true, is a very important moment in your life. It's, it's that life changing moment. If there is a God, if Jesus is God's son, if everything that he says and did is actually true and actually happened, he rose from the dead, he was born of a Virgin Mary, and now I believe that, that's transformational. I am now putting myself in the hands of this Jesus, and I'm following him, and I'm doing what he says. Why would you believe that? Why would you believe it to be true? I mean, it kind of sounds far-fetched, a guy raising from the dead, somebody being born without a father. I mean, how is, how is that even possible? You'd have to believe some pretty unbelievable things. How does anybody come to that place? Well, I want you to think about the shepherds. Why did they believe that Jesus is who he said he was? Well, in Luke chapter 2, verse 9, it says, And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were filled with great fear. Why did they believe the message? Why did they believe Jesus was being born? God's son was here on earth. Well, I... An angel appeared out of nowhere and started telling him. Not just one angel. The Bible says that there was an army of angels that appeared to these shepherds who were just out in their flock by night. The sky got lit up with angelic glory. And it was so bright that they had to put on their, their shepherding sunglasses. And these angels were declaring to them that God was here on earth. I think you'd probably believe it too. Why did the shepherds believe? Because they were chosen by God to receive the message, and it was unmistakably miraculous. They knew that this was special. This had to be true. This can't be made up. This can't be something that's fake or false. It kind of leads to the question, why doesn't God just send angels to everyone? Why doesn't he just, over the top of New York City, send an army of angels to say to everyone in the city, hey, God is real. You should believe in Jesus as your own personal savior. The disciples thought that same question, and if you do have a little Bible study in the New Testament, you'll find a moment where the disciples say to Jesus, hey, send, send people from heaven, send, send messengers from heaven to earth and have them tell people that this is true. And Jesus said to them, listen, I could send back Moses, I could send back, they have, they, I've been sending messengers this whole time, and they haven't chosen to believe them. Why would they believe angelic messengers? We think it's a good idea, but God said there's something more powerful than an army of angels to share the truth. Let me repeat that and, and let me emphasize it for a second. There is something more powerful to share the, proof, the truth about Jesus than an army of angels. And do you know what that is? It's you and it's me. God has said and God has chosen you and I, to be the salt and the light of the earth. He has said for believers in Jesus, you are the most effective messengers for making disciples, for telling people the truth, and for people to hear the truth from you is the method that I am using to spread the good news. We are the good news messengers of Jesus, and it's the most powerful way that, we are, that the truth can be spread. If you are a believer in Jesus, you have incredible power backing you up in this particular message and particular story. Are you sharing it? Are you telling people about it? Is it something that you have to spread out to other people? You believe it. You've been convinced by it. And God says, hey, you're more effective than an army of angels appearing in the sky. But for these shepherds, it was the angels that God chose. And here's what we want to realize from this thought today. Believing in Jesus is always the result of divine intervention. No matter the messenger that Jesus sends, he is always intervening divinely in the moment that you believe in Jesus. For these shepherds, he was sending angels, and that was a God moment. For, for myself, he sent a lady named Mrs. Good, and that was divine intervention. That was a God moment. 
for Dylan in the parking lot. He had his friend on the phone. For Kristen, she was listening to a speaker. For you right now, it might be just tuning in to this YouTube message. This is divine intervention. And the Bible even says something more powerful is happening behind the scenes, that the Holy Spirit draws people into a belief in Jesus, that God himself is actively pursuing your heart and your soul. And I remember sitting in that classroom realizing, I can't let this go. I can't forget this. I can't move this on. What was that feeling? What was that thought? That's the Holy Spirit leading you, divinely intervening in your thoughts, in your hearts, and in your emotions so that you will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, do not quench the Holy Spirit. Listen, if you're here right now listening to this and you've never put your personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, today could be the moment where God is calling you, choosing you, moving divinely, intervening in this moment that you would choose Jesus. Maybe you've tried everything. Maybe you've gone to other places. Maybe you've rejected Jesus in the past. In this moment, I'm saying to you, God loves you and God wants you to accept his gift of salvation. His son was born so that you could have life and have life eternal. What's stopping you from believing? What's stopping you from believing in the Lord Jesus Christ? There's nothing that you have ever done or ever said that God cannot forgive you for, and he's offering that open forgiveness. Maybe you, you used to follow God and you've walked away from him, you've walked away from the church, and God is calling you back. He's divinely intervening in this moment. He's saying, hey, I love you, follow me. I'm here to give you life and life more abundantly. Would you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ today? You know, the way that you do that is simple. You believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. The Bible says that anyone does that is, is saved by God. And if you will, in these moments, believe that Jesus came, that he died on the cross and he rose again from the dead. And you accept the free gift of salvation. You accept, you accept his, you trust in him to save you. And you say to him, God, I'm sorry for my sin. Will you please forgive me of my sin? I want to choose to follow you with the rest of my life. In that moment, through that prayer of confession, in believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says you will be saved. If today you want to pray that prayer, or you, if you've prayed that prayer, if you have that belief and you're ready to confess it with your mouth, today you can do that. You can do that in the quietness of this moment, or you can go to branchlife.church slash the gospel we're linking it in our conversation right now in the, in, the, in the comment section, and you can look more about it. If that's you, I want to encourage you to pause where this is and go to that website and just do some business with God. And if you would let us know, that would be awesome. If you've prayed that prayer, maybe text your friend that invited you. Maybe put in the comment sections, I prayed that prayer. Raise your hand there or let us know by filling out the information in that in that gospel tab or your connection card. We'd love to know that you decided to follow Jesus today, that your divine appointment was today and that God divinely intervened and you have decided to become a follower of him. That's a little bit about what the shepherds did. When they heard the good news, when you first heard the good news and you believed in Jesus, well, what'd you do about it? Well, they, they believed, right? Like they said, I'm going to believe this and it's going to cause me action. I'm going to uh, for many of us, we prayed to accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, but it even goes deeper than that. In Luke chapter 2, verse 16 through 18, it says, They, the shepherds, then went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. So they started running. They're like, we have to go see this thing. We have to go go witness for ourselves what these angels were telling us about. We have to run towards Jesus. And they did it. They went with haste. I don't know who haste is, but he keeps showing up in the story. Haste and, and, and the shepherds went and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw the baby, when they saw Jesus, and for many of us, we saw Jesus for the first time when we were introduced to him, when we chose to believe, they made known the saying that had been told to them. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. They couldn't stop talking about it. They had to share it with other people. What Just a few people did they say. They, they shared it with all. All who heard it. They, I kind of imagine that they went kind of around the whole town of Bethlehem and they started to tell people what had happened. They shared it with Mary and Joseph. They shared it with, with the, the neighbors in the stall, the animals that were there, the other people that were in the inn. They just decided to say, hey, there was an army of angels and they said, Jesus is here and look, he's here. You should go see him too. And everybody wondered at what they, what they did. Listen. 
when we see Jesus, when we believe in it, what it causes us to do is it causes us to worship. I've got to lean in. I've got to see him with my eyes. I've got to experience him. And it causes us to witness. It causes us to talk to other people about it. Look in Luke chapter 2, verse 20. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and all they had seen and all they had been told. They actually kind of went into a celebration song service. They were, they were singing about these moments. They were rejoicing in these moments and they were praising God in these moments. Here's a powerful truth that I think we see in this story. Worship of Jesus motivates my witness for Jesus. Worship of Jesus motivates my witness for Jesus. What is worship? Worship is being in the presence of God. Worship is giving God glory. Worship is pointing to God, experiencing God. That's what worship is. It's so much more than just a song. It's something that we can do on a regular basis. But we gather together as a church to worship. We worship God with our families. And when we worship Jesus, it motivates our witness for Jesus. We can't stop talking about him. I want, to, I want to ask you a question. Why, why should you go to church? Why is going to church so important? Hey, going to church is important because it motivates your witness. If you push worship aside, you are pushing witness aside. Now, what's the problem with that? As a follower of Jesus, we have been instructed to give Jesus, uh, we've been instructed by Jesus to go and make disciples. You've got this truth. You've got this good news. You need to share it with other people. My worship, the deeper I go in my relationship with Christ, motivates my witness. The more fruit I will bear. That's what these shepherds did. When they, when they met Jesus, they couldn't stop telling people about him. Today, as we begin 2020, I think it is very important that we pause and we stop and we intentionally worship Jesus in this moment. Worshiping him and reminding ourselves who he is, why he was born, reminding ourselves of his death, his burial, and his resurrection. When we see Jesus clearly in these moments, now we have the opportunity to share him with others. One of the ways that Jesus calls us to worship him is through communion. The act of communion is, is explained to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So at the beginning of our talk, I mentioned we were going to do communion together and if you are uh, ready and you have your elements, we're going to jump into that right now. So grab that drink and grab that bread. We're going to start with the bread and then we'll go to the cup. And let's do communion together. Now there is a warning in this moment. The Bible says not to take communion half-heartedly or, or, or foolishly or with the, without concentrating on it. And so I want to encourage you wherever you are to focus in on this moment if you choose to participate in this communion time uh, through this virtual time together. If you're choosing to do that, let's let's think about what we do in this moment. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, as it talks about communion, it says that this act of communion, this act of worship accomplishes three things. Number one, it accomplishes confession. We are supposed to examine ourselves and to ask Jesus to forgive us of our sins. The very thing that his body and bread were broken for was for you and for me, for the sins that we've committed. And so we want to make sure that there's nothing in between our relationship with God, that we're not holding anything back, that, that we've asked God for forgiveness, and in those moments that we then take the communion cup. But it also says that we do this in remembrance. We remind ourselves of Jesus' death and burial. The reason that he was born was to come and to die. And then he says it's a way to proclaim. It's a witness. It's a proclamation that we have together. So let's begin, let's, let's take a moment as we launch into 2020 to worship God through communion. Let's pray for us as we go into this time. Lord, as we come and celebrate communion together with you, we, we want to take a moment to examine ourselves. God, pray along with me as I pray. Will you search our hearts? Will you see if there's any wicked way in me? God, you know the choices that I've made. You know the, the mistakes, the, the words, the attitudes that I have that have been off the mark. You know those decisions that have been wrong and the sins that have marked my life. God, I pray that you would forgive me for those sins. Will you forgive me? God, will you separate those from me? Will you cover those? And God, I, I'm sorry for those sins. I'm sorry for those choices. I'm sorry for those 
wrong actions. And I beg you to forgive me. God, thank you for dying and making forgiveness possible. Thank you, God, for, for bringing healing into my life. And Lord, in these moments, we think about your broken body and your spilt blood. And we remember the cross. God, thank you for the cross. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your suffering so that we could have life and life more eternal. Thank you for taking my punishment and your brokenness. And God, thank you for offering healing in this way. And Lord, help us to proclaim to the world this powerful truth that Jesus came, that he died, that he rose again from the dead so that we could all have eternal life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Jesus gathered his disciples around the night before he was to be crucified. And Paul telling the story says in verse 23, For I received from the Lord what also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then in the same way, with the disciples around the table, he also took the cup. And after supper saying, he said this, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's continue worshiping God through some worship songs together.
We just talked about the idea that our worship motivates our witness, and we've just worshiped God through through communion and through song. And now more than ever, you should be motivated in your heart and your spirit to say, all right, who can I tell? What can I do about it? Listen, God is giving you a brand new year. He's giving you a brand new year where you can make a difference in your life and other people's life by deepening your relationship with him. And, and this leads us to our last and final question. What, what difference does it make today? I want to remind you about what the shepherds did as, after they had met Jesus and as they were worshiping. It says, And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard, all they had seen, and all that had been told to them. You see, the shepherds did go back to their field. They went back to their flock. They went back to their job. They went back to their lives. And God being introduced to you by divine appointment through divine intervention, he does say, hey, you've got to live your life. I have come to give you life and to give you life more abundantly. And, and you will go back to it. You go back to your home. You'll go back to your workplaces. You'll, you'll go back to dealing with the same trials and the same issues that everybody else has in this world. Our friend Dylan, who met Jesus in the parking lot, Remember, he had consequences due to his choices, and he met Jesus, yet still went to jail. But even while he was incarcerated, he had transformation through that process because he knew Jesus. Kristen talked about how uh, she had always been a part of the church, but now Jesus was really a, ma a major player in her life. She had met him personally, and it transformed her relationship with God, and it transforms her relationship with Church, remember, church isn't a building. Church is a group of people who are following after God together. And you're only really a part of the church once you believe in God. And so though you return to your normal life, you still have a different life that is now available to you. The, the ability to walk in the power of God, in the spirit of God, with the joy and strength that God gives, with a peace that passes understanding. 
And so for those of us that have known Jesus, we've been introduced to Jesus, we have come through 2020, we have confidence, we have hope, we have peace, and we have joy in the Lord, even through these hardships, even through these struggles, because we know we have a home in heaven, because we know we have a God who loves us and who's asked us to trust him. We know we have a God who's walking with us through the storm. The, the shepherds would have experienced now being shepherds in a whole different way. You see, these shepherds were probably temple shepherds. In other words, they were raising sheep that would have to be sacrificed in the old Jewish temple system. But when Jesus arrives, he is now the sacrifice for our sins. They were now out of a job. They no longer had to raise sheep for sacrifice because the Messiah had arrived. This was the good news that was brought to them, yet they returned. But they returned changed, and they returned different. Let me give you this truth today, and we'll close with this thought. Meeting Jesus transforms life's rhythms. Meeting Jesus transforms life rhythms. Because Jesus is Lord, because you're a follower of Jesus, your rhythms in life will now change. Hey, why worship and why go to church if you don't believe in Jesus? Why pray if you don't believe in Jesus? Why would I do any of those things? But when I believe in Jesus, the rhythm of worship becomes extremely important in my life. The rhythm of prayer, the practice of prayer becomes extremely important in my life. The rhythm of, of reaching people, of making disciples, of serving and loving your neighbor becomes incredibly important. And God gives us these rhythms so no matter what happens in life, we can accelerate through it with life and life more abundantly. We think that this truth is so very important at Branch Life that we're going to spend the next season of our church studying rhythms and the spiritual rhythms that provide hope and healing through 2021. These rhythms that we need to be a regular part of our lives so that we can have success, so that we can have hope, so that we can be stronger in the days and weeks ahead. These rhythms matter. And these rhythms have all been interrupted. 2020 has been like nothing we've never seen before. We've been asked to, to be socially distanced. We, we can't gather in the groups that we want to gather with. And, and all of the things that we used to do in a regular way have changed. Our rhythms have changed. And so you're probably saying, yeah, I get it. I understand that rhythms are important. Eating rhythms, sleeping rhythms, exercising rhythms, they matter. Just like those rhythms matter, so do your spiritual rhythms, and they've been interrupted too. So over the next three or four weeks at Branch Life Church, we're going to study these rhythms, and we're going to lean into these spiritual practices that will be essential for your health and healing in 2021. I want you to invite you back to join us each and every week as we run into these rhythms. And we have some incredible things planned for 2020. By God's grace, we think we'll be a help to all of you if you become a regular part of Branch Life Church. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're glad that you could worship with us. We want to invite everyone, whether it's your first time or you're here with us every time, to please fill out your connection card. Let us know how this Good News, Great Joy series has been an encouragement to you. Let us know how we can be praying for you. And for those that have filled out these cards each week, we pray for you. We pray for those families that are watching and are in quarantine. We pray for those families that have the ones that they're, they're uh, witnessing to and giving us their names so we can pray for them as well. We're praying for those of you that are having financial struggles and difficulties. We pray for all of those prayer requests that come in through those cards. For many of you, we haven't been able to see face to face. These cards are the way that we connect during this season. So will you fill that out before you do something else? We'll put it on the countdown clock and give you an opportunity to do just that. For those of you that are considering a relationship with Jesus, I want to encourage you to go to that gospel tab. Or if you have a friend that you want to share the gospel with, you can send them the link to that tab as well. And then join us next week as we jump into this brand new series that we're calling Rhythms. God has set forth a rhythm in creation. From the beating of our hearts within to the most remote locations. We were designed for a pace, for a marathon, not a sprinting race. We push ourselves further and faster, but we push our master to the margins of our hurried lives. So let's find a healthy stride, rhythmic like the ocean's tide. Let's slow our speeding to a steady pace and learn the unforced rhythms of race.
It came upon the midnight clear, the glorious song of old. From angels bending near the earth to touch their harps of gold. Peace on the earth, goodwill to men, from heaven's all gracious King. The world in solemn stillness lay to hear the angels sing. Still through the cloven skies they come with peaceful wings unfurled. And still their heavenly music floats through all the wings. song which they bring. Oh, hush the noise and cease the strife and hear the angels sing. Glory to God in the highest. Glory to God their hearts of gold from angels bending near the earth to touch their hearts of Jesus, the love song of 